I have the pleasure of sitting next to and introducing one amazing man. And in fact, during the pre-concert -con uh, conversation yesterday, in the back, I just backstage, I said to Aloysia, why don't you just ask him all the questions? He's much more exciting. He's an amazing, amazing uh, composer, an Emmy Award-winning composer. And so you're going to get to let you're going to get to know him a little bit better in this next um, very short hour. So I would like to introduce Mr. John Wineglass, and uh, please give him a round. Of applause. ask him a couple of questions, a series of questions, and then I will read the flowers. And, um, but uh, let's get to know you a little bit more. Can you tell me, how, you know, how did you become a composer? Tell us a little bit more about yourself and how, you know, who inspired you to compose music? Oh. How did that all come about? Oh, yeah. Well, um, the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, those are my uh, go-to. Um, when I was five years old, I realized um, I had synesthesia, which is a sensibility of colors and modalities and tones, mm -hmm. and I had perfect pitch as well. So at five years old, I wrote my own song called The Rainbow Song, because it was off of the colors of the rainbow, which correlated with the modalities of, uh, mm -hmm. of the well-tempered clavier, the scale, piano scale. And so from there, I uh, started creating my own melodies. Uh, my mom, I, I learned the Moonlight Sonata, second movement by ear, because my, my sister was a um, pianist. So I used to hear her play, and I would emulate her on the piano. And my mom got me lessons. Uh, and I'm no offense to any pianist around here, but she, I'm glad she got me into the orchestra, because I started, started on a saxophone, and I went to flute. My arm wasn't long enough for the flute, and I went to clarinet. My armature wasn't strong enough for that. <laughs> then I was on violin for like a week, and everybody, <laughs> everybody played violin. So I found this instrument, the viola, uh, which is a great instrument, because if you're sitting like fourth chair, you're right in front of the oboes, you're right beside the second violins, and you're right in the center of the orchestra. Uh, and so from a very young age, I started to hear the colors of the orchestra from a very young age, and by the time I was 11, I started to tour. Uh, we went to the former Soviet Union, played for Mikhail Gorbachev during those years, the Reagan years, and then uh, we were in Tiananmen Square just before uh, um, that happened. Uh, so, so we got, so I got to travel. I was like three months away from parents and uh, and, and go see the world, and so I, I got the bug pretty early. Wow. Wow. So what is, what is the most challenging aspect of composing music? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Because um, currently I'm writing a piano concerto, uh, which is uh, time. <laughs> you know, finding time to, um, amongst other things that I have going on, uh, being able to, to take time and get away uh, to, to be able to do that. So that, that's a hard balance for me. So you compose this piece from darkness to light based off of Alice Walker's story, The Flowers. Um, why did you choose this particular Alice Walker story? And can you talk a little bit more about even the symbolism, all the symbolisms that's in that particular story? Yeah, well, Stephanie Santavrosia, she's a, a violinist. Um, during the pandemic, I was commissioned to write a piece called Al Al Alone Together. Uh, which ended up in the Library of Congress uh, as a response to uh, the pandemic. And she was the concert master for that orchestra, but she was doing a triple concerto that same concert, so she couldn't actually play. She was there, but she was playing another piece. And she said, well, I really want to, I really enjoy that piece. I want to commission you to write this piece. And, and a lot of times when I work with arts organizations, I, I don't try to come in and, you know, I'm going to do this, you know kind of thing. I like to serve the community or the communities that I'm, I'm, I'm writing for. And so she had this idea of this uh, short story um, called The Flowers by Alice Walker. And I remember reading it in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And so all the images of that came back to me in a flurry. And I think after we talked about it that week, I was already writing sketches uh, at that point. And so it really resonated. Um, now, uh, the story, if you'll hear it early, uh, later on today, 
uh, ends, ends pretty morbid. Um, and the beginning of the piece, if, if you're there tonight, starts from the, be, the ending and goes to the beginning. Mm. So mm. we start from, um, and I didn't necessarily think about that initially. I just, a lot of times when I deal with hard topics, I always kind of deal with the hard topic and then vigilance and resilience are those uh, things I want to end on so we can uh, end on a, on a happy note but, or a, a progressive note, let's say progressive note. So um, yeah, so you'll hear a lot of that um, in, in the piece. It literally mimics, uh, codifies the uh, poem uh, musically. And the process, just the details of the process of how you composed it. You just kind of tell us a little bit about how that all happened. Yeah, well, um, details in the sense of uh, I play violin, viola, and I play piano, so all those instruments were pretty uh, easy to, uh, to, to, to adapt to. Um, the, uh, this, the story really starts, uh, the, the, the piece really starts with my up finding this uh, cadaver, this body uh, of a lynched man. Um, and then um, the second movement kind of moves into his persecution, how he got there, um, you know, uh, you know, in the Jim Crow era, era which was uh, like, kind of like the second migration of Africans from, uh, from uh, Africa. Um, and then we go into more of her stolen innocence, which is the third movement, um, which, you know, a nine, ten-year-old shouldn't be experiencing anything like that, but uh, um, that's what she comes upon. And then the first movement is, is really her purity in the beginning, where she's, you know, frolicking through, the, uh, through the, um, her backyard and um, playing with sticks and chasing chickens and things like that. So you'll hear that semblance in the, in the, very, last, in the very last movement. So it's back to her. Back to her innocence, a new innocence in a sense, but uh, but uh, vigilant and um, resilient. And I think now is a good time, since we're talking about the flowers, for me to read the flowers for for um, this group here. Um, I will also I will tell you that um, once I, in rehearsal, once hearing your music, the composition, it changed everything for me. I felt as if um, I could go deeper. Um, hearing that music, it was enlightening and awake. I, I felt like I had an awakening, actually. And I really, really urge any of you who have not attended um, this um, his his composite or the the performance tonight with this particular composition. I really encourage you um, to come because you will just see the brilliance of this composer and how he works and your heart. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And you can live stream it too. If you can't make it into That's exactly right. You oh, can right. live stream it if you if you cannot Just sign make up it. for it. Okay. Yes. So I'll I'll go ahead and, and read the flowers and we'll have and we'll also ask if, if there's any questions before we go further. So this is the flowers by Alice Walker. It seemed to Maya, has she skipped lightly from hen house to pig pen to smoke house? that the days had never been as beautiful as these. The air held a keenness that made her nose twitch. The harvesting of the corn and cotton, peanuts and squash, made each day a golden surprise that caused excited little tremors to run up her jaws. Maya carried a short, knobby stick. She struck out at random at chicken she liked and worked out the beat of a song on the fence around the pig pen. She felt light and good in the warm sun. She was 10 and nothing existed for her but her song, the stick clutched in her dark brown hand and the rat-a-tat-tat of accompaniment. Turning her back on the rusty boards of her family's sharecropper cabin, Maya walked along the fence till it ran into the stream made by the spring. Around the spring where the family got drinking water, silver ferns and wildflowers grew. Along the shallow banks, pigs rooted. 
Mayat watched the tiny white bubbles disrupt the thin black scale of soil and the water that silently rose and slid away down the stream. She had explored the woods behind the house many times. Often in late autumn, her mother took her to gather nuts among the fallen leaves. Today, she made her own path, bouncing this way and that way, vaguely keeping an eye out for snakes. She found, in addition to various common but pretty ferns and leaves, an armful of strange blue flowers with velvety ridges and a sweet suds bush full of the brown fragrant buds. By 12 o'clock, her arms laden with sprigs of her findings, she was a mile or more from home. She had often been as far before, but the strangeness of the land made it not as pleasant as her usual haunts. It seemed gloomy in the little cove in which she found herself. The air was damp, damp, the silence close and deep. Maya began to circle back to the house, back to the peacefulness of the morning. It was then she stepped smack into his eyes her heel became lodged in the broken ridge between brow and nose, and she reached down quickly, unafraid to free herself. It was only when she saw his naked grin that she gave a little yelp of surprise. <gasps> he had been a tall man. From feet to neck covered a long space. His head lay beside him. When she pushed back the leaves and layers of earth and debris, Mayop saw that he had large white teeth, all of them cracked, broken, long fingers and very big bones. All his clothes had rotted away except some threads of blue denim from his overalls. The buckles of the overalls had turned green. Maya gazed around the spot with interest. Very near where she stepped into the head was a wild pink rose. As she picked it to add to her bundle, she noticed a raised mound, a ring around the rose's root. It was the rotted remains of a noose a bit of shredding plow line, now blending benignly into the soil. Around an overhanging limb of a great spreading oak clung another piece, frayed, rotted, bleached and frazzled, barely there, but spinning restlessly in the breeze. Maya laid down her flowers, and the summer was over. So, <laughs> that gets me every time. <laughs> so, it's very hard to read. Um, let's ask, before we move on, uh, are there any other, are there questions that you have? for our fine guests here. I oh, yes. have a question about the story. I wondered if there was a significance to the name Maya, but it's, it's not. Well, clear. I know. I love the name Maya, so I had to look it up. And Maya actually is group Greek for myopi, nearsighted, mm -hmm. which I am nearsighted. So the way I see it is that, well, you can disagree, John, if you'd no. like, <laughs> but the way I see it is that Mayop was in her little world. It was summer. It was, she had her chickens. She had her song. She had her stick. She loved life. And um, she, all she could see was what was in her vision, what was close to her. As she got out further, her new path, then she got further away you know, it's blurry, more blurry. Then it comes closer. As she gets closer, her sight becomes much closer. 
and she sees it's a, her, her innocence has ended. You know, even with being nearsighted, the, the knobby stick which she has in her hand is like a cane in a sense of, you know, for blindness. So there's, I see that there's a lot of symbolism and the more you read it, the more you find more of that as well. Even the keeping the eye out for snakes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Garden of Eden, it got, the Garden of Eden, you know, the snakes that come. So, yeah, it's um, so it's a beautiful story. I really had a hard time um, finding the the rhythm there, but the story itself is 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 incredible, incredible. You want to. That's great. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. I have to add the outfit you had or last night and the bare feet. That just <laughs> did it. That just pulled it together. Yeah. Uh, that was well, that is beautifully done. That, oh. Yeah, it's well, you think of trying to get into Myop's head. Um, it's, you know, being grounded, um, being a child, and being close to the earth. And I think that was very, very important to do that. So that will, I, I, I have to, it's hard for me to read the story actually with shoes on. Right. So, yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, the, your musical piece sort of reverses the order of the story. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. is, is that Maya's journey, somebody else's journey, a journey at all? What is it? Well, it's a journey told uh, the opposite way. Um, it's, 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 um, Going back to semblance again, I talk about resilience and vigilance, and so hopefully her as a, an adult woman has surpassed that, and it's it's caused her to uh, become a better um, uh, a person and an advocate for uh, equality, things of that sort. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you how does the creative process kick in for you? How do you kind of immerse yourself and prepare yourself? <clears throat> yeah. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Oh, Could she you? asked, um, I, "What is my creative process, yes. and how how do I go about writing um, <clears throat> a piece like this?" Uh, uh, like I said, I think after uh, Stephanie and I actually talked, and I read through the through the uh, short story, the the music came immediately. It's kind of like I, I went up to uh, um, Mount Constitution and I got a theme <laughs> uh, like two days ago. And I'm like, what is happening? This is crazy. So I had to run back to the hall and get on the piano and kind of codify and write it down because I didn't want to forget. Uh, and that, I, that's not planned um, for me. It's a, you know, I call it downloading a divine experience. Mm -hmm. uh, this place is very beautiful, and so like Big Sur is a lot of place, a place that I stay and, and write a lot. It's very, uh, it, 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 you know, it affects you. And so for me, musically, that's how things happen. And so that's that's kind of how it works for me. And then there's the heavy lifting of note for note, you know, meters and things like that. I don't have an orchestrator. I write every note. Everything is very intentional uh, in the score. So, um, can uh, what's what's are, are any questions regarding this particular piece, or because I just want to get deeper into his thinking, what's what's next for him? Are there any questions with respect to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're next. Oh, me. Yes. Oh, um, he has a. Uh, the, the darkness to light, to, what in architecture we would call book match, you know, the story that goes from light to dark and then the, the music that goes from dark to light. And did you see it as, as strictly a reversal or did you see it as a continuation of Myop's journey through the trauma into, into healing, mm -hmm. which I would think would sort of leave her transformed, perhaps healed, as much as possible, but also transform, not sort of, I mean, once innocence is lost, you can't unlose it. Yeah. And I, I just, I wondered what your thinking was on that. Yeah, I would say the latter, for sure. Uh, just that uh, uh, coming out a different person, even through something as tragic as that. So yeah, I would say coming out uh, stronger. Um, but at the same time, kind of 
you know, you know, um, shedding light into, you know, someone should be able to keep their innocence in that in that regard. And so, uh, <clears throat> these things should not happen. So, yeah. Thank you. I was so curious. Um, first of all, I was deeply moved by the reading last night, but by that that stunning piece that you wrote. Thank you. Um, and I thank you. So I remember that, and we did today talk about how you see color and modality. And did you have colors in each of the movements? Is that because there was whether or not it was because you had told us about it in the audience last night, or whether it was just that the music evoked? Mm -hmm. So, as you were writing, what were you seeing in terms of? Yeah, I don't necessarily actually think about it, it just kind of happens. So, like, um, there's a Seven, the, the second movement is called Persecution. It's kind of a seven, eight, dot, 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 dot figure kind of thing. And that's in D minor, which is color red for me, which is pretty, pretty intense. I don't know if that's from, as a kid watching Fantasia in the beginning of Fantasia, Takata <laughs> and D, <laughs> the, Bach, the Bach cantata. I don't know if that's, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's an influence, but uh, D minor is, is red for me, so it's a pretty, uh, so that movement is, is uh, uh, vacillates. Um, and then we come to, uh, there's a kind of a water passage, I call it, where the piano has a lot of arpeggios, and that's in kind of G major, uh, which is more of a, a, a magenta kind of color, so mm -hmm. it's softer. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily think about it as I'm writing, it just kind of, kind of happens that way, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I asked Jackie once, how in the world can you write music? All those <coughs> notes, I just, it boggles my mind. <laughs> and he said, well, it's like writing a letter. Mm. That helped. Yeah. So I appreciate your colors. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I, I like to tell a story, uh, yeah. and that comes a lot from my TV background and film background. I. Um, I am a proponent of new music for sure, but um, uh, a lot of times my critics are saying I'm a Hollywood manipulator, and, and so, you know, but if music is not manipulating or telling a story, I, I mean, we look at television and film all the time, that's the master manipulator from senses to visual to these things, but they help tell a story, so if we're not doing that, then I don't know what the purpose of art or music is. So, uh, so I kind of drive it, drive it home in that way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, Mr. Weinglass. Last night was astounding, amazing, and amazing the way the music uh, went so well with the story. I wanted to ask you if you were an Alice Walker fan all along and about her reaction to the piece. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I have been a fan, but I don't know her, you know, in that way. Um, uh, so, yeah, but I've always been a fan. Her, Toni Morrison, um, all those guys back in the day, for sure. Again, you know, representation matters, and so when you see people uh, of, of, you know, but the thing about it is that this is a story that repeats itself in many ways. I have a piece on the Esalen tribe, uh, the Big Sur Symphony. Um, I will be writing a concerto concerto for, I was in Kosovo towards the end of the war. Mm -hmm. So I was there during the conflict and um, Serbians and uh, Albanians. And so actually I met a cello, she, well she from that conflict ended up migrating to the States. She became a concert cellist at Juilliard. And uh, I was online one time and I commented on a flag of hers, which is the former flag of Kosovo. And uh, she said, how do you know about that flag? I said, well, I was there during the conflict. She was like, no, you weren't. You couldn't have been. I was like, yeah, I was there. I mean, we, we were part of uh, restoring bomb churches uh, there uh, uh, with, a, with a group. And we took a choir and did this whole deal. And so, uh, so she was like, well, you have to write a 
cello concerto for me. Uh, she's really involved with the Albanian uh, consulate. And so, again, same kind of story. I mean, why can't we just all get along, as <laughs> my brother said. You know, I just, I just don't understand, you know. I, I love the differences. I love people from different cultures and learning. Um, I just don't understand why. Um, mm -hmm. wh and it's, it's a human frailty, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, I've been to Auschwitz. I've been to uh, Dachau. I've been to the shores of Africa where the ships came in and took, you know, people. Um, and it's the same feeling. You know, different stories, different people groups, but the uh, same feeling. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just telling those stories through my music. Yeah. Is this a premiere performance? This is a Pacific Northwest premiere. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, have you ever contemplated a light show to go along with it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. I concentrate on the music. Uh, I, you know, I, I did this, the lighting, the images, that's that's not my wheelhouse. I, I let the the experts handle that stuff. I, I really focus on the music, all those little notes that you talk about. Uh, there's enough to focus on, yeah. You have a daughter. Yeah. Is, is, is she following in your footsteps and with music and composing? Um, no, I started teaching her violin when she was three and that was a disaster. <laughs> uh, so she is, um, she is artistic very much, so she's a double major animation in Japanese. She's fluent in Japanese, a minor in art history. And she has, this summer, she has a uh, internship at the Getty. So she, she can go into a museum and tell you everything, periods and, and all that stuff. So she's, she kind of ran away from, she's still artistic, but she yes. just, oh, yes. just in a, diff yes. a different way, like making her own path. Yes, yeah. like Sophie. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, so what's what's next for you? Oh, yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm commissioned out to 28, so, um, oh. yeah, it's, it's... Can you talk about some of those? Oh, yeah, 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 they're all, they're all in contract, so the next piece I'm finishing right now is, uh, is on, um, uh, it's called The Great Migration. Uh, it's for Lara Downs. She's a NPR. Uh, she has a radio show on NPR, but she's also a classical musician. She's a classical musician first, actually. Uh, and this is a piece. Actually, um, I have a symphonic piece on the migration of uh, Africans to the shores of South Carolina, where I actually found the plantation that my people uh, were on. Um, and as I said last night, um, I was in Manchester, England, doing an interview with the, um, the family that enslaved my family, actually. Oh. So we uh, did a whole kind of a thing on that. And so that piece um, got performed and is being performed. I'm finishing three more movements for that with four chords. Uh, but the piano concerto ties into that because it, it's, the, it's called the Great Migration, meaning the migration that happened, the Jim Crow migration so which is tying this piece as well into it because um, that migration people ended up in Chicago they ended up in New York my parents ended up in DC um, people ended up in California so it's that it's a piano concerto uh, that is uh, based on that and uh, um, and then there's this piece which uh, it's dealing with Jim Crow as well uh, and then I have the cello concerto I have a clarinet concerto that's coming up I have a piece on Steinbeck that I'm currently writing, full chorus. I was a huge Steinbeck fan. And living in Monterey, it's like you, you're there in the Salinas Hills and, you know, uh, Canary Row and, and the Red Pony, East of Eden. Uh, I, I love all that stuff, the Americana. So uh, that's a piece that I'm currently writing, which premieres in October. So that's coming, coming out pretty soon. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just... Uh, uh, yeah, and then I'm doing a piece on Yosemite. Um, so I like to do a lot of pieces on nature and, 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 and well, Orcas Island. <laughs> uh, yeah, that might be something. <laughs> that might be something. That, that might be something down the road since I came up here and found a, a theme. So this piece is on Yosemite. I'm doing that with Fresno Phil. Um, uh, one of the donors took me out on a Cessna. We flew right over Half Dome, like I like actually touched the top of Half Dome. Uh, we flew over the Sierras, which was at the time covered with snow, out to Nevada. 
um, which if you've ever done that, it's unbelievable because it just drops from the Sierras down into the, 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 the desert of Nevada, which is like, what? Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm doing a piece on that. And we're going to have it hopefully down on the, uh, the bed floor of uh, Yosemite Park. Mm. So with the symphony, uh, so that's that's another. Yeah, I got it's a lot of projects going on. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. And and, yeah. and the summer was over. Is that one of the top one yeah. of your top favorites? Do you think? Well, they're like all they're all like children. So okay. you, you don't have any favorites, you know. I just they're all uh, different kids. So uh, I um, yeah, I don't have a favorite thing. I see. Okay. Yeah. But they're all related, for sure. But, but Orcas is the best place you've ever been to in your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> Clarification. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was pretty, I was actually pretty shocked that yeah. that, that happened. Gotcha. Going up, going up there, and I thought, oh my goodness, this this is amazing. You know, you guys live in a. I was just in Maui probably a, a month ago, and I didn't get that sensibility that I did when I came here. Mm. So uh, that's that's saying something. Okay, <laughs> I think we have time for a few more questions. If you have. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you ever composed for dance? Is that just a different type of composing? Typically, uh, people want to uh, like the unborn, unborn, unmarked piece. Uh, someone wants to put that to dance. So typically, I, I don't actually write for dance. They, you know, someone will adapt it to dance. Uh, I haven't had that opportunity uh, to, to do that, but yeah, I'd be, look, I'd be interested in doing something like that on the onset. A lot of times people are choreographing to the music. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yes. I'm curious, when you said that on Mount Constitution you have a theme, does that occur to you like a, a melody or is it yeah. a feeling? Yeah, it was a melody, man. It was a melody. <laughs> oh, I can't sing it. In fact, that's why I had to, I usually record on my phone, but you know, my my vocals are not that great. And just so that when I come back to it, that I know that it's solid, I ran back down and got to a piano and, and put it on the piano so that I don't get it mixed up with tonalities that are happening. So, so yeah, it's a melody that comes. So, yeah, yeah. Outside of more classical music, what genres of music do you enjoy? Oh, I, I do anything that pays the bills. It's like, <laughs> no, but I, I, I've done jazz. I've, I've, I've toured with uh, Aretha Franklin. I've, I've done stuff with Whitney Houston. Um, I've done stuff with Andre Petrelli. Um, uh, so jazz, gospel. I used to tour with the Harlem Gospel Choir. Mm -hmm. We did like 40 cities in Germany alone and, uh, to pack audiences. So I, you know, genre is a, it, yeah, it's just it's just a vehicle for communication for me. So yeah. What, what is your dream commission? What would you love to have somebody ask you to do for them? I, the fact that I'm doing this is the dream. So I'm living the dream. So oh, that's that's, that's the way I, yeah, people ask that question a lot. What is the, you know, yeah, I, I, I never thought at eight years old, conducting my cousins and everything with pieces of paper, <laughs> that, I would, that I would be doing this you know, for a living, and, 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 and I was an accounting major, finance, <laughs> who worked for for work, who wanted to work for Lehman Brothers and Aunt Anderson, and none of those are around anymore. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, uh, thank God that trajectory changed. So, I went to New York, made money, but in a different way. <clears throat> yeah. I'm struck by this piece being so archetypal, all I could think of was Persephone. <laughs> you know, her innocence being taken into the underworld. And, right. Um, that's so archetypal, it just comes unconsciously almost, I, I pretty much think. So that this is an example, as I see it. Right, um, yeah. For, for this archetype. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Innocence no longer. Right. Mm -hmm. And then how do we live? Mm -hmm. Right? How do we how do we overcome? I mean, I talk about the people who I met in Albania when they went through that struggle, um, and some of them we still, you know, people talk about social media. Oh, blah blah blah. blah but I mean, I've kept in contact with some of these people because of that, and some of them become world renowned artists. Um, one lady, one girl, she's she was 14 years old. She's now a model. Like so, you know, through struggle. 
Um, they, 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 you know, people, we, human, human, the human uh, factor kind of uh, works through, through, through hard times, you know. So it's like kind of like uh, what they call it, uh, uh, being put through the fire. The dark okay. night of the soul. Yeah, exactly. The dark night of the soul, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think it's been wonderful that we get to know John a little bit more every day. It's something new. Um, he's quite an, quite an accomplished composer, but also quite a man in his own right. Um, so we're very happy that you could do this today. Uh, thank you again, John, and thank you all for attending. Appreciate it. Cool. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.